Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Aerospace Nation series. Now, it's no secret that the electromagnetic spectrum is vital for executing key missions in modern warfare. While the functions executed in this realm vary, their common denominator ties to information. The side who has the decision advantage is generally the side that wins. That's why it's absolutely crucial that we maintain an electromagnetic spectrum operations, or MSO for short, advantage. We're really fortunate today to discuss the factors surrounding this issue, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. Major General Dan D-Day Simpson, Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff, Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance at Headquarters Air Force. Retired Major General Ken Israel, former Assistant Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Airborne Reconnaissance and Director of the Defense Airborne Reconnaissance Office. Colonel Bill Dollar Young, Commander of the 350th Spectrum Warfare Wing. And Mr. Ken Dworkin, Executive Advisor of Electromagnetic Combat at Booz Allen Hamilton. So with that bit of introduction, um, I think those of you who are in this business know these people well, and you know you're in for a real treat. We're going to start with uh, Major General Simpson, followed by Colonel Young, then Major General Israel, and then uh, Mr. Dworkin. So D-Day, thanks very much for being here today, and let me turn the stage over to you for your remarks. Hey, Dave, thanks for, for having me, uh, and thanks again for an opportunity to get out of the building at least for a little bit although I'll get sucked back in the vortex uh, this afternoon. Um, I, for many of you who know me, I, you know, I'm not paid to be an optimist. I'm paid to be a pessimist in, in my profession, uh, either intelligence or informational warfare. So uh, as you would imagine, uh, the current crisis has eaten up a lot of bandwidth. And I, you know, I'd like to use that as a, a point to be able to highlight that, uh, you know, that Russia-Ukraine crisis is a perfect example right now on why we need to prove, improve our information warfare capabilities. And when I say information warfare, I'm talking about electromagnetic superiority operations, I'm talking about cyber effects operations, and I'm talking about intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance operations. All of those currently reside in the headquarters Air Force A26. Uh, so I would say that uh, you know, for those who are disbelievers out there, and uh, and there are several, um, you know, we're prepared to pieces our profession, but you prepare for war. And I would say right now, war with China, war with Russia is not necessarily unlikely. So if you prepare for it, it's a fantastic deterrent effect on potential adversaries. And as you probably heard on Tuesday, the secretary mentioned that China's modernization rate is the reason why we need to ensure that we're ready for that high-end fight. So when we span that spectrum of conflict, most of us go immediately and directly to high-end conflict and kind of forget about the cooperation portion that we need to do with our allies and partners, uh, the competition against potential adversaries and, and try to deter there. Then there is a crisis. Russia, Ukraine is a good example right now. And then you move into conflict and we need to be prepared across that entire thing. So I would, I would postulate that uh, um, right now we are in armed conflict below the threshold of kinetic yield. So what do I mean? It's not a shooting war yet, but if you're operating in the cyber domain, in the information space, um, in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, it is a conflict. There's a lot of activity going on right now. Russia and China are not constrained by our archaic way of thinking where everything has to be kinetic. So uh, they have no qualms of being in conflict with us in those spaces right now and are fully committed um, not only in doctrine and intent, but actually by what they have fielded by improving their spectrum superiority capabilities. So from the headquarters Air Force side of the house, you know, what we do is the deputy chief of staff uh, in those mission areas will provide the secretary, the director of national intelligence, the undersecretary of intelligence security, 
the chief uh, and all of our partners on the half staff throughout the Air Force, that strategic level expertise, the policy, the strategy across cyber, uh, ISR and EMSO. Uh, so planning, policy, budgeting, execution, um, ot &E, acquisition, force design, all those real sexy things that a lot of people do not want to pay attention to, that's what we get to uh, pay attention to. So I'm uh, from someone who's been operational pretty much the 35, 36 years that I've been in, I am uh, finally paying for my sins. So I'll, uh, I'll leave with, uh, walk off the stage with two comments. So I, I think we need to push hard on a paradigm shift to get away from conflicts of just purely kinetic in nature and start to open up the aperture on, we need to pay attention to the non-kinetic as well as the kinetic, because uh, you're seeing conflicts on both sides. And then I'm going to pull a line from our director of um, the AMS directorate in A26, uh, Brigadier General T.C. Clark. I would say, uh, and I completely agree with what he says, EMS is the most critical maneuver space linking joint all domain operations, without a doubt. And, you know, it's, it's like that old Saturday Night Live. I need more cowbell. We're going to need more EMS zealots to be able to do this effectively in the future. And Dave, I'll turn it back over to you or turn it over to Dollar. Joe Deptula, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and thank you uh, for having me uh, on the panel. Uh, it really is an honor to share the stage, even if it's a virtual stage with such a distinguished group. Uh, as we start to look at spectrum warfare. Uh, what I would propose is that what you see is, if you look historically, you have a gradual evolution with two key inflection points. So if you go back and look at uh, the early pre-World War I, World War I, what you had in terms of the conflict and competition in the electromagnetic spectrum was largely skirmishes. You had single transmitter versus a single jammer. And you had more and more of that. But I would argue that you had an inflection point as soon as both sides started to figure out that by connecting multiple jammers and multiple transmitters together, you actually could get a significant increase in the overall capability of that system. And so the development of the Integrated Air Defenses, or IADS, I believe created a major inflex inflection point that fundamentally changed the nature of not only the conflict in the electromagnetic spectrum, but the very competition in the electromagnetic spectrum. And so that went on for quite a while until just fairly recently, where we had the introduction of what's called the complex emitter. And the complex emitter, uh, for, for those that aren't familiar, uh, was basically the introduction of software to significantly, in some cases, significantly expand the capabilities of various threats. So the electromagnetic spectrum, like many other industries or competition spaces, was fundamentally changed by software, which brings us to where we are today which I would argue is spectrum warfare. And it's, distinct, it's distinguished and differentiated by what has come before us, not just by the increased integration and connectivity among both offensive and defensive systems, but the growing use and the importance of software. I'm often asked, uh, hey, Dollar, what is it that differentiates uh, spectrum warfare from the electronic warfare that's come before it. And that really is the two most important things. It is the expanded connectivity and the ability to fight no longer system versus our uh, individual platform versus individual threat, but rather to combine and fight true system on system uh, engagements. But not only that, the important role and the increasing and potentially decisive role that software is going to is going to play. Uh, one of the things that I like to point to that sort of really brings that home is if you look at the operational view with the OV1, which is uh, any group of things that we expect to work together 
as our mechanism for delivering a capability, what you will find without a doubt is a bunch of lightning bolts connecting all the individual pieces. And what I like to point out is that prior to 25 June, we did not, this year, we did not have a single Air Force organization that was charged with making sure that all those lightning bolts were there in order for our, our individual platforms to work together to deliver the capabilities that are required by our warfighters in both conflict and in competition. And so I think that that really is at the essence of what we're here to talk about today, the technology, uh, the organizations. Again, I, I'm so proud of, of our organization because of what we're building and I look forward uh, to further questions. Very good. Okay, over to you, General Israel. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, good morning. I guess uh, I'm here because I represent the corporate memory on this distinguished panel, having accumulated nearly uh, 50 years of operational planning and technology development experience in electronic warfare, electronic combat, and the spectrum warfare mission area. In the past, I've uh, advocated for both quality and quantity improvements in spectrum warfare systems. Where I found quality, I did not find quantity. And where I found quantity, I did not find quality. So we're engaged uh, in strategic forms, we currently reviewing policy, doctrine, and regulatory matters, and they need to be addressed. China and Russia both consider uh, technology as a national asset and a, and a strength. So that, that's where the real fight is right now in terms of who is control of the technology and how is it transitioning into military systems. Uh, I think we've, uh, we've moved over the period I've been associated with electronic warfare and electronic combat. And now GEMSO, I, I use GEMSO versus spectrum warfare because I'm not quite sure if we've truncated uh, IMSO uh, into spectrum warfare. Uh, spectrum warfare is not doctrinally pure, but GEMSO is. Uh, I can remember when we made the shift from electronic warfare to electronic combat. The definition I had at the time when I briefed uh, the seniors in the Pentagon was electronic combat was action taken in support of military operation against the enemy's electromagnetic capability. It included electronic warfare, of which EA, ES, and EP, and we need more work in EP, uh, against uh, an adversary. Well, uh, now we have GEMSO, and the definition of GEMSO I work with are military actions undertaken by a joint force to exploit, attack, protect, and manage the electromagnetic operational environment. These actions uh, include and impact all joint force transmission and reception of energy. So uh, we are in a, a, another evolution, if you will, of what's happening into this dynamic uh, mission area. By the way, uh, before I get into this too much, I want to thank General Deptula, who put spectrum warfare into practice during Desert Storm and uh, Northern Watch. Institutionally, we owe him a massive debt of gratitude because in the early 2006, 2007 timeframe, he shifted the focus of Intel to intelligence surveillance reconnaissance directed, which functionally included ISR, cyber, and EW. He clearly proved that this transformation organization structure of spectrum warfare can and will work. So let me just quickly talk about uh, five areas here that kind of come to my mind. Number one, strategy. We have to get it right this time. Uh, we need an updated national security strategy and a national defense strategy. Uh, they're late to need, but these can't be uh, aspirational documents. They have to be action documents that embrace what to do and when you're gonna do it. We need to be very clear how spectrum warfare supports the joint warfighter concept, and the joint all-domain command and control. I'd like to see the nuclear posture review with its nuclear command and control and the missile defense review included in the national security strategy. But that's just uh, my you know, perspective on all this. Second thing I'd mention is uh, management. Uh, it, 
Currently, spectrum warfare or electromagnetic uh, spectrum uh, operation is extremely dispersed. The Air Force and Navy have IMSO nestled in the A2 and A6, where I think it belongs. The Army has it in the G357 demo structure. At the OSD level, the CIO is lead for policy. And at the combatant command, U.S. STRATCOM is responsible for the operation and planning lead under its UCP responsibilities. The thing that I'm really uh, happy and, and enthusiastic about is to see this synergy going on right now between U.S. STRATCOM and the CIO. They're working extremely well together and they're building a foundation so that we can create future uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation among the department, agencies and services uh, more than anything else. The third thing I'd mention is speed. If General Hyten was here, he would say, that's my number one concern. I think it's gonna be Admiral Grady's concern too. We have to do things faster than uh, in, in the spectrum uh, warfare world than just about any other missionary. To me, it is incongruous to have an EOB reprogramming cycle measured in months, not hours or days, months. China understands the extreme short refresh and in technology insertion timeline, and to improve is to change, to be perfect is to change constantly. Now let's take a look at the threat. Obviously, some uh, comments have been made about China and Russia. They've closed the gap. I encourage everybody to read Peter Schweitzer's new book entitled Red Handed to see how this happened. Chapter four is entitled Silicon Valley, and it tells you what you need to know about the IP theft and how our high tech companies are putting the U.S. in a weakening situation. Uh, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, look, the work that Google is doing in China benefits China's military as much as it does the civilian. You know, you've got Microsoft setting up an AI lab in China as we speak today. You've got Mark Zuckerberg basically has a his, has his staff read the government of China for all of his staff. That's 515 pages about how China has uh, um, incentivized socialism into their uh, economic uh, goals. So why do they do this? Why does uh, Silicon Valley have an open door? Well, it's because of data. You know, you know what beats algorithms? Data. And that's why they're doing this. Uh, so it's something that we need to be uh, attuned to. And that China calls this whole operation, by the way, uh, targeting influence ops as elite capture. Speaking of the threat, we also need to move our focus from the Fulda Gap to the Sawaki Gap. There are eight countries today that face Russia from the Baltic to the Black Sea, and all of them be being challenged every day. And as General Simpson said, Ukraine is the latest example. Last thing I think we should talk about today a little bit is we're halfway through this fiscal year 22 with a continuing resolution. You know, you it's very hard to catch up and stay in the lead with a starvation budget. Now, I get the idea that we need to look for investment efficiencies, but you can only be efficient so far. And then you got to think about resources. The bipartisan budget agreement on the Hill is still impacting us because the ratio between military and civilian uh, uh, obligation expenditure uh, amounts is still a hot topic. Recently, the Mitchell Institute published a, a document about drip feeding IMSO and why it will not work in this current age. So with that said and done, I look forward to it. And I think it's going to be a very stimulating conversation today. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Ken. Over to Ken Dworkin. All right. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here this morning. It, it really is a privilege to share the virtual stage with General Simpson, General Israel, and my good friend, Dollar Young. All are dedicated spectrum warriors and professionals with remarkable records of service and thought leadership. For more than 35 years, I served as an intelligence community officer, including joint duty assignments at four of the big five IC agencies. My home organization was the NSA, where I entered on duty as an ELAN analyst in 1982. Today, we'll take a God's eye view of Intel support to electronic and now spectrum warfare through two lenses. 
Lens one is the familiar people, process, and technology framework. Lens two will add the dimension of time to juxtapose practice circa 1982 and 2022. For each element, I'll suggest a cornerstone aspect of the way forward. Process. I learned systems engineering through assignments at an IC organization that truly relies on that discipline, a pragmatic view given how difficult it can be to fix problems once a satellite is in orbit. Those tours demonstrated the importance of having a solid concept of operations or CONOPS before developing a complex capability. As regards Intel support, the 2022 CONOPS isn't meaningfully different than the 1982 CONOPS. Air Force Instruction 10-703 codifies a serial, multi-organizational eWare process involving production of technical information, enabling mission data generation, validation, testing, and delivery. I acknowledge and salute the many good people working hard to improve mission data quality and timeliness, but the eWare process remains a figurative orbiting satellite with problems. The process cornerstone, reimagine the CONOPS in a modern context. Technology. A traditional exposition would extol the promise of applying modern technologies such as AIML, DevSecOps, microservices, AR, VR, and more to spectrum warfare. While there's real value to those across the board, I'm gonna to point to something else. The surprise technology cornerstone, virtual collaboration. Where web 1.0 was basically an electronic encyclopedia, today's web 2.0 is a space for user-generated content, information sharing, and collaboration. The spectrum warfare community would benefit from a common environment within which to harmonize data and capability integration efforts to eliminate delays inherent to today's serial workflows. Each organization would bring its data, expertise, and solutions to the commons and work the Gordian culture and policy knots as a team. People. Good processes and innovative technology ultimately depend on people, the most important element of the PPT framework. Let's take one more trip in the time machine to look at education and training. The challenge in 1982 mirrors the challenge today, managing critical ELAN analysts, EWO, and related talent. To its credit, the DOD is getting after EMS workforce development through the 2020 EMS superiority strategy. The best talent management formulation I've heard was articulated by 16th Air Force Vice Commander, Major General David Gatica, when he said that workforce development comprises four stages, recruit, train, retain, and retire. Most organizations focus energy and resources on inside the fence line, local mission training, and career pathways. But there's a huge opportunity at the recruitment and retirement ends of the talent pipeline. General Israel's Mitchell paper talks to these but I would offer a unique specific recommendation targeting the pipeline source. <clears throat> In order to quickly multiply the quantity and quality of EMS career ready professionals, universities might develop and instantiate undergraduate degree programs with compelling EMS focused curricula. Graduates from an EMS centered program incorporating physics, engineering, math and information technology would inevitably enjoy promising career options in academia, industry or government. The Spectrum Warfare People Cornerstone is therefore curriculum. We recently kicked off a grassroots initiative to explore the art and science of the possible with respect to undergraduate EMS degree programs. If you're motivated to help address this enormous national challenge, please reach out to me through the Mitchell Institute. Okay, thanks very much, Ken, and uh, thank each of you for your insights. Uh, what I'd like to do now is dig into some of the points that you raised in a little more detail. So here, here's a question for all of you. Uh, some critics frequently point out uh, that the defense community neglected electromagnetic warfare capabilities for the past 30 years. Obviously, and some of you have already said this, this runs counter to what we saw and are seeing uh, China and Russia do. So what actions and investments should we pursue uh, to reset our capabilities in this realm? Again, uh, any, any one of you actually would like to hear your, each of your comments. Let's, let's go in the same order. Uh, D-Day? You're always concerned when when one of the panelists says, "I'll be brief on this one," which means you know they'll they'll lead up the next time. But I, I definitely will be short because I I want to hear what some of the other folks are so have to say on this one. 
you know, I hit some of these points during the opening portion, so I'm not going to retread all old ground about our archaic way of, of thinking about kinetic warfare. Um, you know, I think we're all in agreement we're not moving fast enough. So, you know, the question is, what do you do? What do you get, go after uh, to bring additional credibility to an integrated deterrence uh, as an interim national security strategy is, is getting after? So part of it is in the documentation. So we hit already about the um, electromagnetic, both for the DOD and there's one for the United States Air Force uh, uh, superiority strategy. Uh, the, uh, our electromagnetic spectrum operating uh, concept is in draft and is working through the widgets right now. Uh, and then uh, we are also working on our implementation plan. And anybody who's worked with our secretary, you know, he is not shy about giving feedback. Uh, and we got a lot of very direct feedback to take a, a implement our strategy the implementation plan was looked too much like a strategy and not enough hard uh, impact quantitative things to be able to do it. So the team is going back with all that ready. So um, the two big things that I wanted to hit was uh, prioritizing EMS talent management, as Ken mentioned earlier, to make up for 20 years of, of neglect. So it's very similar to uh, cyber. Um, the EMS OSMEs are, are very low density and incredibly high demand, and that's only going to increase in the future. So alternate pathways, is, as we've hit a couple of those, and I'm sure we'll talk a, a couple other techniques on recruitment and retention for the employment. And then the other one is investing in EW capabilities. So I would propose we've been limping along when it comes to you know, the traditional electromagnetic support and the electromagnetic uh, protection capabilities. Um, and I, I really do mean limping along. There's really been no investment there. If we talked about electromagnetic attack capabilities, we absolutely gutted that with the exception of the EC-130. And then as we transition into the EC-37, uh, but that is uh, you know, a single platform as we're trying to go to a platform agnostic, software designed, multiple capable uh, um, inject portions that we may touch on a little bit. So uh, did I mention we need to go fast? We're, we're two decades behind now that we've ceded that territory uh, to the Chinese uh, and to a lesser extent, the Russians. So we're going to have to get after it. Over. Very good, Dollar, over to you. Yes, sir, I would say uh, three Cs capabilities, connections, and cognitive. And what I mean by that is capabilities in terms of data, and that being for us, mission data, but also the introduction of missionware applications, uh, which is a new way to rapidly deliver uh, capability to aircraft in the same way that today you get apps to your air phone, uh, your uh, iPhone. And I know a lot of people are talking about that, but I'm so proud of the men and women of the 350th Spectrum Warfare Wing because they're getting after it right now today. It's baby steps, but they're doing it. Uh, and then connections. So networking and this idea of the ability to stitch together uh, different heterogeneous systems that were never made to work, that were never intended to work together but always had that latent uh, capacity to be combined uh, into a composite system that gives you the tools that you need to solve a particular focused warfighter problem. And then finally, cognitive. The application of artificial intelligence and machine learning to electronic warfare. And what's really powerful about that is I would argue that there are four basic competencies of any information age organization, data apps, networking, and AI. And if you, if you look at what I just said, then I, the 53rd Electronic Warfare Group, which we grew out of, had a competency in data. And then the three things that I've just given you are the IOC criteria for the Spectrum Warfare Wing. So if, if my team is able to put all that together, then that is absolutely a positive step in terms of getting to where we want to go. And what's particularly powerful about that 
is that we're not talking about stuff on PowerPoint, stuff that's years out. We're talking about reaching IOC either this summer or in the fall timeframe. Again, it's not going to be everything, but we're doing that today, right now. And so the things that General Simpson is laying out, we're actually operating on that. And so when you get that alignment from the very top of the Air Force, you know, the secretary early on talked about cognitive EW. If you through Air Combat Command, for those of you that have not listened to General Kelly's uh, keynote at AFA uh, from the fall, I would urge you to do that. Uh, I think it was visionary. I think his points on uh, the use of the electromagnetic spectrum are well said and very, very, very savvy. Through my boss at the Warfare Center, uh, General Cunningham, who just a couple of weeks ago was talking about what the Spectrum Warfare Wing is doing down to our wing. So as we start to get aligned like that, not to mention the partners and in industry across uh, AFRL and other labs, that's powerful. That's what we're going to have to get after. And that's how we're doing it. Over. Very good. General Israel. Well, uh, to me, I, I, I kind of go uh, right to uh, what's the hot issue in the arena. And the hot issue in the arena right now is we need uh, a better over the horizon uh, ISR indication warning capability. Uh, one of the things that the big regret we had of pulling out of Afghanistan, we lost a lot of that. And, and let me tell you, when you're at the tactical strategic edge, you've got to have a layered uh, over the horizon uh, capability to be able to detect uh, not only friendly forces, but adversary forces. I think Heidi Shu gave us a checklist of things that are very important that we've uh, kind of uh, not paid attention to in the past. Her list at the very top uh, mentions artificial intelligence, integrated networks, uh, she, uh, microelectronics, and hypersonics. I mean, that's a very good checklist of saying, let's get after this and let's get after it fast. Now, I'll, I'll probably hit the ball right back to a dollar because, you know, I'm surprised we've gone this far without talking about SOSA and CMOS. I mean, if you're going to, we, we kind of move from analog systems to federated systems to integrated. You know it better than I do, uh, General Deptula. You know, the iNews, ICNIA. I mean, the whole thing about sharing information across mission areas and domains was the heart. And that was our bread and butter. I mean, let's get back on this. And, and that's why I'm hopeful that this, uh, this new... Uh, uh, EMS uh, steering group under the uh, XCOM and the EWCT can now, you know, bring the various pieces together so that we know. And here's a real life example. You know, submarines for a long time were experts in a low probability of intercept. Other services didn't know that. Why, why are we, you know, wrestling with a problem when all we have to do is knock on the Navy door and say, hey, could you kind of share some of your techniques or no problem with intercept signals? That's the kind of disconnect that we got to be better at and leverage at. Okay, thank you. Real quick, uh, Mr. Dworkin. Uh, yeah, I think uh, just the, the short answer from my perspective is, uh, is unity of purpose uh, and, and shared vision. I, I think everybody's running real fast. Not, not everybody's running uh, to the same destination. So, so getting sort of department-wide uh, appreciation for what the to be looks like, what the future state looks like, uh, will allow us all to do essentially what dollars already started to do, although the other services haven't necessarily bought in in exactly the same, the same way. And with respect to curriculum, Dave, I spoke about uh, I spoke about young people. Everybody knows across the government, across the DoD, that cyber is the responsibility of every single individual. Nobody really looks at EMS that way. Nobody really appreciates that that EMS is the same way. It's the responsibility of every single individual. So it's not just a matter of a handful of experts. No, thank you very much for that. I'll just uh, add two cents here because the question was what actions and investments should we pursue to reset our capabilities in this realm? You all address that to a degree. Let me be real specific. We also need investment. We need to put the dollars into this mission area. Um, you know, someone mentioned EC37. Well, there's a rumor on the street that the, the plan buy is going to get cut uh, in an era where the plan buy is only a fraction of what we need. So the Air Force needs to be a little bit more vocal in terms of the need for increased budget share relative to the other services uh, because it's been neglected. I, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again to this audience because 
Not a lot of people uh, recognize this, but the Air Force has been the least funded of all of the services for the last 27 years in a row. Okay, next question. Now, on this one, we could spend the entire time. So all I want is a yes or a no, because we'll dwell on this for too long. So the question is that some have argued that we ought to establish the electromagnetic spectrum as a domain of its own. There are pros and cons to the, to the argument, particularly with respect to increasing resources and organizational factors. But again, a question for all, should EMS be defined as a domain on its own? We'll go with D-Day first. No, uh, it's critical maneuver space, uh, but I don't recommend it being a domain. Okay, uh, Dollar. Sir, yeah, uh, you have to define domain and get agreement on domain first. That's to me is the biggest problem is that we talk past each other. This is yeah. simple. Things have definitions. Uh, there's epistemology, the study of knowledge. So you define domain, get agreement on that, which has attributes, and then you just look at the electromagnetic spectrum and say, does it have these attributes? If it does, it is. It's not that complex. In it's simple in terms of the framing of it, but it becomes very, very critical in terms of the implications. And one of those implications is you have to realize that in our definitions forms our models. And if other people have a model that's more nuanced and inclusive, then we potentially, based upon how we answer that question, we may set ourselves up inadvertently in an asymmetric intellectual disadvantage. Wow. I'm glad this is being recorded because that was a nice, succinct summary. Okay, uh, General Israel. Um, there's a saying that the eye of the eagle is not that of the worm. So uh, I, I believe I'm a worm, maybe a glow worm, but I'm a worm. And so my view on this is basically to uh, paraphrase and quote General Hyden. He said, absolutely not. He said, basically, uh, IMSO is embedded in every missionary and across all domains. So then you're kind of on this slippery slope. Okay, uh, Admiral Fogo, who was the former uh, Navy chief in Europe, said, well, let's make germ warfare a domain. Uh, you've had people say, well, let's make uh, humans a domain. Uh, I've had people come to me and say, Ken, why don't you use your influence with uh, General Deptula to get uh, social, moral, cognitive as domains? Uh, I've had other people come to me and say, how about cyber, electromagnetic, expect and information as domain? Look, this is not about domains. This is all about connectivity and governance. And that's why I think U.S. STRATCOM and the CIO have hit the nail right on the head. It's not about governance. It's about connectivity and cooperation and collaboration. Okay, thanks. Ken Dworkin. Uh, yeah, a little, little bit. I, I know that's a, uh, you know, it's kind of a trick question, Dave, but that's all right. I, I'm going to say ultimately. <laughs> that's pretty it, straightforward, uh, man. Yes or no. Is it a, should it be a domain or not? No, I ultimately, I, I'm just going to say it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay. I think we can, okay. uh, I think we can uh, do what needs to be done either way, but what's, what's necessary is sort of a, you know, a conceptual North star, right? A way of thinking about it logically, elegantly, uh, that, that reflects on the things that we do underneath that, uh, you know, in that arena if you will. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the succinct answers. I'm an absolute yes, uh, because definitions matter. And uh, so what we have is a, a tie a tie vote. We have two yeses, two noes, and it, it doesn't matter. All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, MSO operating concepts. Fighting and winning in the electromagnetic spectrum goes beyond just technology. Some of you have already talked about that. Uh, and it does require some new operating concepts. So where do we stand on this? Dollar, let me toss this one to you because you're, you're closest to it, I believe. Sir, very, very, very happy with the work that uh, General uh, Clark and his team have put together. I think that when that comes out, uh, to me, the most important thing uh, is to lay out a theory of victory uh, and a mechanism whereby to achieve that. And I think those ideas are absolutely in our, uh, in the, in the concept. And I look forward to being able to talk more and more about that in the future, uh, because that, that really, I, I would, my personal opinion is that's, that's kind of been the, the thing we've been lacking as a community. Uh, because if you look at, and, and folks have heard me say this before, you know, if you go all the way back to Julio Duhay and in his, 
nascent theory of air power, you really have the ideas of strategic bombing. It's there. And it takes roughly 100 years of technology evolution, but the technology is always in pursuit of that concept, that theory of victory that says, hey, if I can master the air domain, I can provide a disproportionately uh, increased uh, or disproportionately high uh, leverage point in the ability to achieve my nation's policy ends. Uh, and so that's what we've lacked in the electromagnetic spectrum. And I think while not perfect, those critical little nuggets are there. And now we just have to uh, take those and turn those into things like, and that, by the way, uh, that's got to feed our technology. And so uh, the idea of SOSA was brought up open and the modular open systems approach. Why should you do that? Well, now if you have a concept or a theory of victory, that becomes the why that drives the necessity for a lot of other things that have heretofore been just unconnected good ideas among a community of practitioners. I'd, I would also add there is an element of the reverse case too, because advanced technologies enable new and innovative concepts of operation. And it, it, we, you all said it. I, I mean, operations in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, cyber, these offer completely new and innovative ways of creating desired effects on our adversaries. Okay, thanks for that. Let's move on uh, real quickly because uh, there's so much to talk about here. But Given that budgets are tight, what technical areas do you think should receive top prioritization when it comes to uh, uh, trying to uh, seek maximum value in uh, IMSO? Uh, uh, and I'll just toss it out there. You, all of you don't have to answer it, but whoever wants to grab that one, go ahead. There's just a couple things we're working on the half staff on that front. So. If you looked at it big picture, I'd say the first one that we're looking at, uh, we, you know, we tend to go for capabilities first. This one is not a capability. You need it to be able to organize, uh, command and control all the capabilities. So electromagnetic battle management. So how do I effectively do this across the entire spectrum? Uh, and then if I look at a capability, the highest one on our priority list right now uh, and this is uh, one of the things that uh, we're working with ACC, 16th Air Force, and with Dollar's team is, you know, uh, to get away from a old think of I need to have a jamming platform to be able to target radars. Hey, can I get after that effect some other means? Can I use the electromagnetic spectrum to deliver a cyber effect that may give me some persistence on that whatever the target may be? And how do I get after that? How do I do it effectively? And that gives me a lot different platforms to be able to launch that from. So I need something that is platform agnostic. I need something, you know, Dollar will definitely know this one, software defined, reprogrammable, and something that uh, I can apply algorithms. I don't want to say AIML because that's thrown around way too much, but apply a adeptly trained algorithm to, uh, to be able to get a compatible solution and something that is adaptable as we progress through competition and in, in crisis. So when I make those investments, you know, to the secretary's point, does this scare China? So does it have a deter deterrent value or effect? Uh, what are its capabilities in competition? You know, instead of going straight to conflict, what, what can this do for me in competition? And then look is this thing, how's it work in conflict? Is it survivable during the high-end fight? So, and it can't just be um, one portion. So to be able to do that, I need to make investments in the ISR side. I need to make investments in the cyber side and the EMSO capabilities to achieve that kind of effect to bias more uh, lethality um, in either the non-kinetic or the kinetic side of the house. Hey, thanks very much for that, uh, D-Day, particularly reminding us that we can have all the, the whiz-bang uh, 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 MSO capabilities in the world, but you got to have a way to, uh, uh, to manage them. So battle management is uh, extraordinarily important uh, in, in this realm, uh, just as it is uh, in the, with the lethal elements. Um, this one's for... Uh, uh, General Israel and uh, Ken Dworkin, uh, how have you seen Congress's interest 
in electromagnetic spectrum operations evolve? Is there increased attention in this area given the rise of peer competitors? Or do we have to do uh, uh, a better job in educating Congress about this vital mission area? Either of the Kins. Yeah, Ken, please. Um, let me kind of start and I'll let uh, Ken uh, amplify and add on. Uh, we have something called the Electronic Warfare Working Group, and that has been uh, very uh, helpful, uh, timely. Uh, you, you've got uh, a couple of uh, people on that uh, uh, group, uh, Stefanik, uh, uh, Congressman Bacon, uh, Longren, who's uh, maybe going to retire, uh, Smith. There, there are people who uh, obviously understand uh, the criticality uh, of electromagnetic spectrum operations because they see it as a leading indicator of intentions. It's a very uh, complex, um, uh, highly technical area. And so you, you have to be, uh, education always helps. Obviously, it always helps. So to the extent that we can continue to have a sustaining education program on the Hill can only be helpful. It's got to be put in the context of when you have so many uh, shortfalls, where do, where do you begin to uh, find balance and what, what's going to get funded uh, when, you have, when you're dealing with a continuing resolution and you're halfway through the fiscal year dealing with that? I think that, um, that any opportunity in the Mitchell Institute, uh, I know the various think tanks around the, the the Beltway have gone in and provided uh, options and solutions. But as you said, uh, General Deptula, and I couldn't agree more, it, it's just fundamentally, the whole portfolio is short. And you, you're not going to be able to make significant improvements on the cheap. You, 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 you just can't do it. So when you're trying to recover from an, an era where you've had thinning resource go into uh, this mission area, it, it's going to be a hard sell when you basically have no discretionary income. It's not only because the funds aren't there, flat budget, but you've also got inflation piled on top of that. So when you take those two facts together, uh, you've got to look for high leverage areas. And I think uh, Secretary of the Air Force and uh, Heidi Shu hopefully will soon have a AS counterpart in, in uh, OSDAS that kind of, listen, we're missing key advocates in key positions in OSD. So, you know, until we fill those slots, it's kind of hard for us basically on the sidelines to advocate, you know, what is inherently their responsibility. I think uh, US Stratcom, I, I think the CIO, I think all the A2, A6, all, everybody that had an opportunity to go and positively influence Congress has done a remarkable and a good job doing that. Okay, quick, Ken Dworkin. Yeah, Dave, I, I do wanna amplify that real quick. And I, I'm just gonna point out my perspective is, con I think Congress does get it. Uh, I don't know that that translates into, you know, into effective action, but I wanna quote something from last March's uh, testimony by uh, Dr. Conley and, and by Brian Clark from the HASC. Do you remember the HASC uh, uh, subcommittee yeah. testimony on DOD MSO? So th these quotes are really very interesting, Dave. So this is, this is verbatim. 15 years ago, the Electronic Warfare Working Group issued a report on EW and the Pentagon that concluded that what needed to happen for focus was that we needed to have leadership, we needed to have a pipeline of training on EW, and we needed to have the R&D budgets that result in capabilities. Okay, uh, that's all good. The next statement was super interesting, though. Can you explain to me how, if I came back, if I was here 15 years from now, that your report, which largely mirrors a report we wrote 15 years ago, won't say the same thing? And I, I think that was kind of a mic drop moment. But uh, so it, it shows they get it, but they're skeptical that, uh, uh, that, that things are improving. No, thank you both for that. And um, thank you all for that uh, discussion. I mean, we could go on for hours, but what I'd like to do uh, is we've got uh, quite the audience out here, and I'd like to open the session to their questions. So when I call on you, please unmute your mic and uh, state your name and affiliation before asking uh, your, uh, your, your question. So with that, let's go to Mr. Uh, John uh, Turpak for the first question. Thanks very much. Can you hear me, gentlemen? 
Yeah. Okay. So um, at the uh, old Crows meeting in uh, December, General Highnote was talking about uh, given that we are so far behind the Chinese, or at least not up to par, maybe in a near term uh, conflict with them, the way to do it is to simply flood the air with electrons and fight fractured because we, he said, we, we do it better than the Chinese do. So my question is, uh, we didn't do the B-52 standoff jammer. How do you flood the air with electrons? And uh, if you could talk about whether you think that's a, a winning strategy for a near-term conflict. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take the first one to my uh, good friend, Lieutenant General Hynote. So yeah, um, so I, I love him because he's on the force design side of the house. So, um, you know, we have able to take that concept to actually, how do you employ it? Um, it is interesting. I'll stay away from some of the classified stuff, but I would say um, our capability, our training wise, we've, we've made the recognition that, you know, we say contested environment, uh, but we really haven't trained to operating in that contested environment, in a calm out environment. And it, it can be as easy as thinking about, all right, how does my F-35 or F-22 uh, pilot actually employ when I have no voice or no data link uh, to the actual aircraft? You know, now going to more of a mission type order things, or how do I operate the ISR enterprise if I don't have reach back capability to be able to do some of the analysis or I can't get it from whatever sensor, we, we throw around the magic buzzword sensor to shooter um, to do targeting. Yeah, there, are, you know, there are a lot of steps that, that happens in there. It's not just like finding a, a moving target indicator and going in and, and uh, pickling or rifling away at whatever the target is. Uh, I would like it to be that easy, but I think the environment is going to be that complex. So um, first, we're going to have to train to it and then develop a capability to be able to shut that down. Uh, there are efforts along that line, uh, but, um, you know, it's efforts right now. Could I add a comment to uh, support uh, D-Day? Sure. Uh, I, I flew in the B-66 as a standoff jammer. I've flown in B-52 as a standoff jammer. The fact of the matter is, what's standoff? General Neptula can answer this better than I. We're being pushed further and further back. So when you're pushed further and further back, I mean, physics of physics. So you're going to have to basically up the power if you're going to have, you know, ERP on the, on the threat. At some point in time, if you're pushed back far enough, th th there's not a, an onboard uh, jammer that's going to be able to make a difference. So this is the linkage between technology and conops. And again, I wish Brian Clark were here who could address that. Maybe you load up unmanned systems, expendable platform with a jammer. Uh, has that been done before? You bet your boots. The Russians are doing it in Syria today. Uh, so, you know, putting, uh, th there are a lot of ways that you could, I, I think that's the whole concept, one of the key concepts in Mosaic, that you can have wingmen controlled by the pilot in an F-35 or an F-22 sending these assets out to go ahead and in a one-way mission neutralize these uh, key uh, platforms that our adversaries are using and kind of blind them. And that's what we want to do. So I, it me, it's a combination of technology and a change of conops. And just Very one last to add, add just one more thing onto that, because I think it's an important conversation because we might not be as far away as we think we are. And what I mean by that is the world is increasingly becoming software defined radios and reprogrammable multifunction arrays. My iPhone is a software defined radio. We don't think about it in those terms, but might we be able to take advantage of the transmit capability to flood the airwaves at particular frequencies? Maybe. Um, as you start to look at transmitters and where they transmit and this, as you start to now add uh, the, an operational approach that define, that is just requires you to take away certain frequencies for certain periods of time to open windows of opportunities across other domains, there's probably a lot of really creative things that we could potentially do. It won't get us absolutely to where we want to be and where we're going. But if we start to pull together these multidisciplinary 
multifunctionary teams that have engineers, operators, intel analysts, maintenance personnel, uh, industry services. And as we start to pull that together and get after uh, the problems that we find today, focused operational problems, not solving world hunger, I think we'd be surprised at what we might be able to do. Over. Okay. Thank you. Here's one that, uh, uh, interesting question texted in from uh, Scott Oliver. Uh, Scott says, my question is about EMS enterprise governance. Not too long ago, uh, General Gadecki said we were shooting behind the duck. Is the subject subjugation deep down inside the A2, A6, the final answer? And does that effectively communicate the importance of this subject within the Department of the Air Force? If not, where should it go and who should be responsible? Um, D-Day, I'll give you the first opportunity to respond to that one, uh, but I'm sure there are other ideas on the panel too. Roger, uh, well, I, I kind of keyed on subjugation right there, and I'd say that's probably not the, the right approach that we're, we're taking a look at. So it's one of the DCSs. So you know, I think most people are tracking that uh, this capability came over from A5. Wherever it is, it needs to have the priority both for operating concepts, governance, planning, programming, and budgeting. Um, so uh, obviously from my foxhole, I would say 826 is the right place at the half staff for that because I am able to link it effectively with ISR and with cyber effects operations as I start to apply uh, information warfare uh, capability. So look at this holistically instead of a stovepipe of excellence approach. Uh, the governance portion, I, I think, you know, I'm not sure when Trout made those comments, uh, but yeah, I would say now with uh, the strategy and now the operating concept that is working its way through process and then the implementation plan, we are on a path to get that on the streets. Is it going as fast as, as we would like? No, but you know, we'll keep, keep our foot on the accelerator there. But I, I think we are making progress. It's just, uh, I can't take it you know, from a zero to a one overnight. Okay. I'd like to add one thing if I can. This is Ken Israel. I, I think we're kind of minimizing the outstanding work that's being done at US Stratcom in terms of their synergy working with the CIO. I, I mean, they're breaking trail. They're, they're making some significant inroads there. And with the stand up of the uh, joint electromagnetic cell and its two star, two star general reporting directly to the uh, commander of US Stratcom, I think you're gonna see a major uh, muscle move in terms of improving that capability. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one more. Uh... Please be brief in your response, although it's, a, it's an interesting question. This is from uh, Sean Gant. In regards to talent management and investing in capabilities, it seems the Navy and Air Force are going counter to this principle in how, excuse me, in how they combine spectrum defense operators with other cyber fields. The agile airman concept only generates jacks of all trades and not subject matter experts. The Navy instructors at the Spectrum Ops Schoolhouse at Keesler do not have field experience, and admittedly, they likely won't when they return to the fleet. Our near-peer threats, however, take a different approach and have SMEs in the Spectrum and cyber fields. Are we setting ourselves up for failure by tasking our Spectrum operators to do non-Spectrum-related tasks and duties and systemically creating non-SMEs? Any thoughts on that one? Too much in the weeds? I, I'll just say this, that this whole area is gonna become uh, technically more demanding. You're not gonna be able to just say, I'm learning the principles of electronic warfare as I did back, you know, umpteen years ago. You're gonna to have to be conversant in 5G, cloud technology, uh, interferometry, uh, by statics. Uh, so you're going to have to kind of realize that you are going to become a fellow in a very specialized, highly technical area. And I, I see uh, the opportunity to spend a little bit of time in the ISR arena, a little bit of time in EW, a little bit of cyber is all 
basically in the, the sum is greater than the individual parts. And that's what we ought to be doing. There ought to be special career management to turn out these uh, very capable talent. And if we have to hire IPAs, so be it. Uh, we, we can flood the field with people that have these technical skills. Very good, Ken. I think that was a nice, uh, uh, a nice response. And, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I want to give a shout out uh, to General Israel's uh, paper, Drip Feeding Improvements in IMSO Will Not Work. Um, it's on the Mitchell Institute uh, website, uh, and uh, we, we just uh, replicated it in the uh, chat room as well. So unfortunately, folks, we've come to the end of our session today. Um, there's so much to discuss surrounding this topic. Uh, and I'd really like to thank uh, Dollar D-Day, uh, General Israel, and Ken Dworkin uh, for sharing your insightful comments and getting us all a bit smarter on this extraordinarily important topic of electromagnetic spectrum operations. So from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, um, we wish all of you great success. And to our audience, have a great aerospace power kind of day.